Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday 12th of May. I'm Cindy Yu, The Spectator's broadcast editor and your host this week. On the show. In The Spectator's cover story this week, Katie Bors asks whether Keir Starmer can escape Beergate and looks at who might replace him. Katie will join me alongside James Forsyth and Guardian columnist Raphael Burr to discuss. While much of the conversation has been about the party leaders, more than 100,000 fines issued to ordinary people who broke lockdown rules are still going through the British courts. Michael Simmons will be on the show to tell us about them. On the other side of the world, Australia is in the middle of an election campaign. Who is going to win and has conservatism fallen out of fashion there? I'll speak to former Foreign Minister of the Liberal Party, Alexander Downer. Has Oxford ruined Britain? Toby Young writes his column this week about Simon Cooper's new book, Chums, which looks at how a group of elite graduates from the university took over our politics. Toby and Simon will join us for a debate. And finally, Roger Hardy's illustrated history of Palestine is reviewed in the book's pages of this week's magazine. He'll join us to tell us about that pivotal century before the establishment of Israel. Before we get going, a very special thank you to Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management, who are sponsoring the Week in 60 Minutes. Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who go above and beyond to offer you support and guidance. Just visit candowealth.com to find out more. And why not subscribe to our YouTube channel too? Click the red subscribe button at the bottom of the video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. First up, have the Tories screwed up Beergate? Keir Starmer has promised to resign if he is fined, giving Labour the opportunity to have the moral high ground. Katie Balls, the Spectator's deputy political editor, writes this week's cover piece and takes a look at the Labour MPs who could replace him. Katie joins me now alongside James Forsyth, our political editor, and Raphael Burr, a columnist for The Guardian. Now, Katie, you write in your cover piece this week that the Tories are actually regretting pushing the Beergate story a bit too far. Can you explain? Yes. So initially we saw Tory MPs and I think Tory aides pushing Beergate pretty hard. And that was for obvious reasons. Um, I think that clearly if Keir Starmer is facing questions about uh, alleged COVID breaches, it takes some of the pressure off Boris Johnson, who has been facing these questions for months now. And there's also a sense that if you can uh, taint Keir Starmer, it neutralises the issue, it's much harder for Labour to bring up. So I think when on the Friday of the local election results, Durham Police announced they would actually investigate this alleged uh, breach of rules by Keir Starmer last year in Durham, involving beer and potentially a premeditated curry, um, there was a sense of jubilation amongst Tory MPs and I think some thought oh what a lucky politician Boris Johnson is um, but I think in the hours and the days that followed you started to get a little bit of Tory nerves that actually perhaps this could have been a bit too successful why is that it's not just that uh, Keir Starmer said he resi- he will resign if he gets a fixed penalty notice which would clearly put some pressure on Boris Johnson though I think very few expect that it would uh, trigger a change in uh, response from the Prime Minister. But I think more concerning is the worry of, well, if Keir Starmer does end up resigning, um, does that mean there's going to be a new Labour leader? And actually, could that leader be much worse for the Tories? And I think that's a new worry. James, is there also a worry that if Starmer does actually resign, then the pressure on Boris Johnson and also Rishi Sunak, those who were fined but didn't resign, will be even greater? Or what would their next step be? I think, as Katie says, it would put more pressure on Boris Johnson. I don't think Boris Johnson would resign. But whoever succeeded Keir Starmer as Labour leader would have a kind of clear dividing line that that Labour had. Labour's leader had quit because he was found by the police to have broken the rules and the Tory leader had not. And and I think also there is a concern, as, as Katie alludes to in Tory circles, that some of the potential successors to Keir Starmer might be more electorally formidable than he is. Katie, can you run us through some of those runners and riders? Yes, so it's an interesting one. Having spent weeks, perhaps even months, calling around Tory MPs and ministers and saying, you know, who who do you think would be good to replace Boris Johnson if he goes? Um, And getting quite a... A li- or often downbeat responses. Um, it actually feels as though there are lots of potential um, candidates, uh, MPs, both on uh, the Tory side but also on the Labour side, think could uh, do well in the in the event that Keir Starmer did have to go. So I think 
the front runners or the names we're hearing the most at the moment are people like Lisa Nandy, who is the Shadow Leveling Up Secretary, former Shadow Foreign Secretary, went for the leadership last time, clearly didn't get it. But one of the reasons people are talking about Lisa Nandy is there's definitely a, a concern amongst Boris Johnson's supporters that he would find it much harder to go against a woman. Dominic Cummings, remember, um, the former number 10 aide, and now I think uh, Boris Johnson's chief nemesis, um, even a while back suggested to Labour that they should ditch Starmer for Nandy if, if they wanted to do well, thinking that arguing that a woman from the Midlands would be much harder um, for the Tory party and would do well for Labour. Um, and then I think in that vein, people talk about Angela Rayner, but I think... Uh, a, some people think Angela Rayner um, would land badly with some voters in the sense they, they say, oh, actually, look at her comments on Tory scum. Uh, this would be a step too far. But also, uh, it's almost a debate that isn't worth having because you're in a situation where, because Angela Rayner was also at the event that Keir Starmer was at, if one goes, you get a sense both will go. Um, now, there's Wes Streeting, who I think is the other name, whereas there's some excitement around Wes Streeting. Um, West Streeting was, received a big promotion in the last Labour reshuffle to Shadow Health Secretary and has since become one of the party's strongest media performers. Um, and therefore, lots of people saying, well, he could really take the fight to the Tories. In that scenario, uh, where there to be a la Labour leadership contest, because clearly we're talking many hypotheticals, um, I think there's some questions that is uh, West Streeting well enough known to win support the unions, which is quite a key factor in how the contest would work. And also, uh, where does he sit in terms of the membership? Because no one is quite sure um, where the membership are on these various issues. Lots of members left after Jeremy Corbyn uh, left the stage. Um, does it mean it's now a, a more centrist membership? I think West Streeting is seen as a centrist and uh, uh, for some, perhaps a, a little t too much to the right, um, though I'm sure he could dispel that in a campaign. Uh, Raphael, let me bring you in here. What do you make of those names that Katie has just mentioned? Well, I mean, in terms of who's ready, who's well known, who's not known, I think that's less of a factor just in the sense that until the vacancy is actually there, you don't really know what the candidacies look like. Um, in terms of Lisa Nandy being the front runner, I think that there's a tricky thing there because she's she's tried before and I think anyone who's been sort of served up you know been sort of sent back to the kitchen you can't really necessarily bring out the same meal again uh, I think that is tricky I think that's also would be a bit of a problem for Yvette Cooper who's another name who's obviously uh, introduced um, the I think it's also almost certainly true that it would be there'll be a lot of pressure institutionally within the Labour Party to elect a woman as leader I think there's a feeling that it's just frankly, embarrassing that the Conservative Party has managed to produce two women prime ministers. Uh, the Labour Party has managed to produce none. The only female leader they've had has been, they have been, deputy, been sort of standing in. So, uh, so that, and then on top of that, the feeling that Boris Johnson's kind of Oxford Union swaggery macho debating style just doesn't, it sort of unravels a bit sometimes when he's confronted with a woman. Uh, and he, I, I think there's the, that, that's a sort of a minor issue in terms of the presentation rather than the policy. Um, for quite a long time now, the Labour Party has grappled with this thing. Keir Starmer hasn't really solved it, which is actually, other than being not the Tories, what is the easy, snappy answer to the question, I am voting Labour because? Uh, and I just think at the moment, you know, when it's just there's so much personal animus against Boris Johnson in the Labour Party. And I think there's a feeling that since Partygate and other, you know, related issues that that might be spreading a bit further there might be a feeling in the country that people just want rid of Boris Johnson that's sort of anaesthetizing labor against the fact that they really need to answer that much more fundamental question and I don't I don't see any leader necessarily who's in the position to to automatically resolve that that if Keir Starmer hasn't done it Mm. And Raphael, one other thing I wanted to ask you about is just the role of the left in the Labour Party in all of this, because <clears throat> it's not just the Tories who have been pushing beer gate, it's also those people who are, seem pretty disgruntled with Keir Starmer's uh, leadership. Yeah, look, I mean, there's two, I can see two sides of this, really. One is that the, the reality is Keir Starmer won the leadership on the promise of continuity as much as differentiation from the Jeremy Corbyn era. Now, he had to do that because that was the membership that we had, as Katie absolutely rightly said. It's a very Corbyn-y membership. 
you know, there, there was a large section of the Labour Party that just didn't realise, I think, or didn't want to accept that the reason Labour got hammered so badly in 2019 is there are an awful lot of people who, who went into polling with thinking that just the one thing they definitely knew more than they wanted Brexit, more than anything else, is they didn't want Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. Now, by the way, I think a lot of Conservatives have misunderstood that as well and probably put a little bit too much emphasis on Boris Johnson's magical charisma for bringing people over, probably underestimate the Corbyn push factor. Anyway, Corbyn's gone. Uh, the membership of the Labour Party has changed slightly. Um, and Keir Starmer has, I think, understood. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it was a cunning, evil plan by him to manipulate the left that much and think, you know, I'll trick them into backing me and then I'll lurch off in a sort of Blairite modernising direction or neo-New Labour, uh, that his instincts might have been a little bit more that than he was letting on. But I think genuinely he came to understand how necessary that would be having one. But the reality is a lot of those people on the left feel betrayed by by the choice that he subsequently made. And of course, he took the whip away from Jeremy Corbyn, which is, you know, a, a kind of uh, a, a iconoclasm for the radical left. But he's also crucially changed the rules. So it's just going to be harder to get a, a radical left MP onto the ballot paper to, to sort of do what Jeremy Corbyn did uh, in in 2015. Uh, and the fact is Corbyn only got on the ballot paper in 2015 because a bunch of more moderate MPs thought it would kind of, in this sort of Ju Jurassic Park, wouldn't it be cute? We've got to let the dinosaurs out and kind of pad around in the meadow a bit, but don't worry, they won't win. They're not going to make that mistake again. <laughs> so I, I, I think, yeah, ultimately that section of the Labour Party likes to be in opposition against the leader of the Labour Party as much as it likes to be in opposition against the Tories, frankly, I mean, culturally, uh, and, and that they will carry on doing that. It, the, the, where it will be problematic is... In a leadership contest, the things a, a more moderate centrist leader has to do a little bit as Keir did, Keir Starmer did, to make sure he's got unions and those people on side that then hem him in slightly when he goes out to the country. Mm. And before I let you guys go as well, James, I just wanted to um, touch on the Northern Ireland uh, issue as well, because last week on the show you spoke to Katie about it. Um, can you update us on what's been going on in the week since, uh, on what viewers should be looking out for in terms of the government and the EU's actions on no the Northern Ireland Protocol? So the UK government is uh, telling the EU, you know, look, if you're not prepared to shift your negotiating position, the UK government will act unilaterally. We've had the news this morning that the Attorney General has said that, you know, the unilateral UK action would be legal under international law on the basis that it would be acting to, pre to protect a pre-existing international agreement in Good Friday. I, I think the big question is that whether the EU is prepared to uh, negotiate on more than just a technical application of the protocol. Because at the moment you're in a situation where you can criticise the UK government's tactics, you can criticise the fact that the UK government signed this document in the first place and is now so seeking to resolve from it. But you also can't get round the fact that there is not going to be a power sharing executive uh, in Northern Ireland unless you can allay the DUP's concerns about the protocol. And I, I think that is the kind of fundamental problem. Now, I think you can, you can perhaps argue that the, that the British, rather than the current tone they're taking, would be better off inviting Mario Seskovic to, to, to Belfast and saying, look, wh why don't you see how you would try and get a power-sharing executive going, given all this? But uh, I, I think that at the moment, we are still in a stage where the UK government is is trying to use the threat of legislation to push it for a change in the EU's negotiating position. Mm. All right, James Forsyth, Raphael Baer and Katie Balls, thank you so much for joining Spectator TV. Now, you might think it's time to stop talking about politicians breaking COVID rules, but the reason it's still an important story is because of the ordinary Brits who are still going through the courts to deal with their own inconsequential fines. Michael Simmons, The Spectator's data journalist, looks at this in this week's magazine. Michael joins me now. So, Michael, we've just been talking about beer gate and party gate, and a lot of people, I think, are getting quite bored with these stories, thinking they're quite trivial. But you make the point in your sidebar to Katie Balls' cover piece this week uh, that actually a lot of people are still getting fined for transgressions that were even less than having a beer or having a, part, a birthday cake. Can you tell us about these th cases that are still going through the courts right now from COVID? Yeah, so absolutely. Um... Basically, because a lot of the, the courts were obviously shut during the lockdowns and the general um, court backlog built up, 
It's exactly the same with people that were fined during the lockdowns and during the tiered restrictions. A lot of those cases are kind of only just getting through the court system now. So in the weeks where kind of Partygate's been going on, we've still seen um, that these 136,000 fines across Britain are being dealt with. And there's some kind of really interesting examples of, you know, f fines for ridiculous things, fines where you think the people are buying to rights, and fines that are really similar to um, what's happened in Partygate and Beergate. Um, some of the examples on the kind of bigger end, uh, there was a student in Leeds was fined £10,000 because, as he says for a joke, he made this um, Facebook event to say, oh, let's have a big snowball fight. Uh, and then within a couple of hours, he thought, oh, this, this joke's a bad idea, it's got out of hand. So he deleted the event, but um, hundreds of people turned up to this park where the snowball fight was to be anyway, and he ended up with um, a £10,000 fine. Um, or on the 18th of December, uh, which is the day of one of the Downing Street alleged Christmas parties, um, a pub in Devon also had its own Christmas party and the landlord of the pub ended up with £4,000 worth of fines. And he's kind of really miffed about this because as far as we know, nobody in Downing Street has been fined more than £50 so far. So there's kind of the question about there seems to be a certain discrepancy between, uh, between fines. The other interesting thing with the fines is if you do choose to contest your fine, which, by the way, most people don't, from the data we've seen, only about 2% of fines actually get contested, and then you end up going through the court processes, the judges are kind of not really interested in much mitigation or what your actual COVID risk were, was. So as an example, um, the regulation about not being uh, in gatherings of more than two people um, a judge has said, you know, in court documents that there's essentially no defence to this. If you're with more than two people, um, then that's you, uh, you've broken the law. Um, a couple of kind of harrowing examples of this. Um, one was an elderly man um, who was quite, he said he felt quite lonely um, and he went to visit his allotment and there he was found chatting to people at the allotment um, and he ended up with a fine. Similarly, there was a lady who had been helping with childcare with somebody who was in a support bubble, which was allowed. And it was the child's birthday. So she went round to the mother's house um, to drop off a birthday card. She didn't go in the house, she says. Um, but when she got there, she didn't realise that the, the, the person she went to see had guests around illegally. And because she was essentially caught on the uh, doorstep, she ended up with a fine. Um, and again, the magistrate judges are kind of not interested or they don't seem to be as interested in these defences and the people all end up being fined. It is incredible because the examples you have, you know, people's fines obviously range from the customary £100, which is £50 if you pay it in half the amount of time, to £10,000, as you say. We talk about this, you know, cost of living crisis. And, you know, I can understand if you organise a massive event, as the student uh, was accused of doing, you have to pay more. But, you know, for people like this pensioner, just being present while other people are there, outdoors, which we now know, is not so bad for the virus. Um, and the fact that he's getting paid, uh, fined a hundred pounds, it does seem pretty shocking. Well, you'd mentioned this discrepancy between the Devon landlord and Downing Street party happening on the same day. Is that because it was like a racking up of fines as you go uh, with different multiple transgressions, as it were? Yeah. So the the case of the the Devon landlord seemed to be that essentially he he was fined twice on the one day. Um, because of kind of the severity of him being the, the owner of the pub and the alleged um, event organiser. Um, and then I think he then committed a, 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 another offence that was similar. So the fines racked up. And again, you might say, well, is this not similar to kind of some of the alleged events we've um, heard about from Downing Street? But what's really interesting when you look at some of the reporting around the court cases is that not only can there be discrepancy between cases, there's even cases where there's discrepancy in the same incident. So one example was from um, a chippy or a chip shop in Notting Hill, where um, the owner had decided that he needed to have a crisis meeting, or what he called a crisis meeting, um, to, to discuss some staffing issue. So all the staff went round his house and they were spotted and reported and the police came. Um, and the police felt that um, this was a meeting that, although business meetings were allowed at that time, it, there was no reason why this meeting wasn't held online. So the police um, issued everyone with fixed penalty notices and some of the cases ended up going to court. And two of the staff, um, one pleaded guilty um, and they ended up with a fine, I think it was around £600. 
Um, but another member of staff on the exact same evidence and um, didn't enter a plea and ended up being acquitted. So actually within the same incidents, we're seeing discrepancies as well. And also across the country, isn't there? Because throughout all our discussion of this, we're talking about the Metropolitan Police in London versus the Durham Police, and they have different standards, which is something that you write about in your piece as well, that Durham Police has been a bit more lenient. I mean, the problem at the end of the day is that these COVID rules are probably just not clear enough, not well-drafted enough in order to ensure consistency when applied across the country. So you end up with weird exceptions. Yes, exactly. So um, if we look at the, um, the uh, data that's available from the police, um, you, you do see kind of variations um, between forces. And a lot of that will have been because of the different lockdown tiers and because of populations. But for example, Durham Police, which you mentioned, I think I say in the piece, um, have so far issued about 1,000 fines. Whereas um, North Yorkshire, which is a neighbouring force, um, I think has issued over 4,000. So there's that discrepancy there. I think the other issue is, especially after the first lockdown, and we got to know a bit more about COVID, about how it didn't tend to track, you couldn't really catch it outdoors. I think people started to apply their own common sense. And you can argue whether they, they should or shouldn't have done that. And I think people decided, right, if I'm going to meet someone, I'll do it outside because I'm least, at least it's safe. And the problem is the law essentially didn't allow you to make that your own judgment. And what see, it looks like anecdotally is some police forces have sort of said, OK, we'll, we'll become more lenient because of common sense, where other police forces have said, no, we're rigidly, we'll apply everything kind of to the, the letter of the law. But what's interesting as well is the attitude seems to have changed kind of within magistrates' courts as well. Because if you look at the some of the earlier cases, um, I saw one count um, was that only around 1% of people were who claimed they weren't guilty were sort of winning their cases. But now that's gone up to about 15%. So it's, it's kind of unlikely that, oh, you know, suddenly if people were 15% like less guilty later on. It's more that the kind of magistrate's attitudes have changed. Um, and it's been pointed out by various legal watchdogs that that suggests that actually many maybe of these past fines and convictions are sort of unjust and perhaps even unlawful. Mm. And it, and it's incredible, you know, we talk about this backlog in the courts that, you know, transgressions like going to your allotment and talking to your neighbours are still going through the courts, as you say, a hundred, over 100,000 of them. And just finally, Michael, what if you decide not to pay your fine? What happens uh, if you just put your foot down and say, I'm, I'm going to appeal, but the, my appeal has been a failure, but I'm just not going to pay the fine. Yeah, so if you don't pay um, within your 28 days, um, you will probably end up um, with a case before the magistrate's courts. Uh, and the majority of these cases are dealt with for this legal mechanism called the single justice procedure. And that's a procedure that's it's designed really to keep people sort of out of actual courtrooms um, and it's designed more for things like uh, non-payment of the licence fee. Um, and people have been quite critical of this single justice procedure because it means that your case isn't heard in open court. Essentially, it's done, what as they call, on the papers. You sort of write in your plea and your evidence and then um, a magistrate and a legal advisor will kind of sit and adjudicate. Um, and that's not really done in a courtroom in earlier stages of the pandemic. You know, the, the, literally the magistrate could be um, working from home and it was really hard to find out through public court listings where these were going on. Um, in Westminster magistrates, as an example, they ended up designating this on their court lists as courtroom 78, which isn't a physical courtroom that actually exists. So in, insiders kind of say this has now become the name for these cases as, oh, it's a courtroom 78 case. Mm. And and you say that what you know you can just if you miss the letter you could just not know that you you've been served one of these and one man find out that he was being fined through his local paper. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think the Mail had reported this that there was a, there was a man in Reading, who I think it was a, a fairly minor um, misdemeanor that co that he kind of committed. And with these single justice procedures, there's no sort of requirement for you to be served with papers or for like receipt of papers. So if you get this fine, uh, you don't pay it because like you say that you've not received any court documents and um, the court will still hear your case, assume you're not engaging and then you can be issued with your fine and local newspapers will go through these kind of charge lists and report, you know, such and such Joe Bloggs um, has received this fine and this unfortunate man, you know, discovered that he'd been fined for literally for reading his local paper. Incredible. Michael Simmons, thank you so much for joining Spectator TV.
Across the world, Australia is in the middle of an election campaign. This week, Alexander Downer, the former Australian High Commissioner to the UK and previously a politician for the centre-right Liberal Party, writes about the main issues deciding the election in the magazine. So, Alexander, welcome to Spectator TV and thank you so much for joining. Now, you write about the Australian election in your piece this week. Tell us, what is going on there? Does it look like the incumbent Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, can win another term? I think it's going to be very hard for him. There are still two, uh, uh, 10 days to go until the election, so there's a little way to go and a lot will happen in that time as new issues emerge. But as things currently stand, Scott Morrison and his party, the Liberal Party, are behind in the polls. Um, so at this stage, Labour are looking in the box seat um, and it's it's not impossible that the Liberals won't turn that around, but it will be hard for them to do so. And what are the main issues that they're fighting on? And maybe you can just give a brief overview and then we can talk a bit more about each of those. Well, first of all, there's the economy. There's uh, Just as in the UK, there's the increase in the cost of living and people are saying that they're hurting and wages aren't increasing as fast as the cost of living is increasing. This, of course, is a consequence of the huge increase in funding there's been in Australia and elsewhere in response to the pandemic um, and the increase in energy and food prices across the board, as you can see in the UK and everywhere else. Um, so that that is an issue. The Liberals, uh, Scott Morrison and his team, they're saying that um, this is a difficult time for the Australian and global economy and the public should remain with the responsible economic managers who have seen Australia through the pandemic. The economy is now growing. Unemployment's only 4%. They save jobs. Um, investment's picking up. So stick with the known quantity. Don't take a risk with Labour. Whereas Labour are <coughs> running the unsurprising argument that people are really battling with the ever rising costs and wages aren't keeping pace and their living standards are falling and they're doing it people are doing it tough um so that is a central issue in the campaign now secondly there is the issue of china and um the, basically that has been a strong suit for the for the government for scott morrison because he's been very robust in standing up to bullying from china and the public have been on side with that, but there's an issue that's come out of left, left field, which is China signing a security agreement with a small neighbouring country, the Solomon Islands. And the Labour Party are making the point that it's all very well to talk tough with China, but you've let the Solomons sign a security agreement with China without stopping it, and you haven't made enough effort to stop it. Um, and the Liberals are saying, well, um, there's not much we could do about it, which is a fair argument, actually, because China's um, spending in the Solomon Islands doesn't match the kind of spending that Austra the Australian aid program focus on. China's spending, um, some of China's spending is going on politicians. Um, and, of course, a country like Australia can't match that and can't, can't morally and ethically try to match it. But that's that's become a bit of an issue. And then finally, there's the climate change issue, less an, an issue in this election than in a lot of previous elections, but nevertheless still an issue. And even though Australia has signed up to net zero by 2050, the opposition and also independent candidates in a lot of safe Liberal Party seats um, uh, are doing well on this issue by saying, well, we will do more. Um, we have a climate emergency and more needs to be done. Not that, of course, Australia is going to change the overall global outcome. Australia only contributes 1.3% of anthropogenic um, CO2 emissions worldwide. But nevertheless, it is an issue. Um, and, you know, people who are very concerned about the climate, that's obviously a reasonable percentage of the population, um, are moving away from the government on that issue. 
Mm. Well, that's a brilliant overview of the three, you know, hot topics, as it were. I just wanted to pick you up first on the economy. You talk about、um, this record low unemployment, all of these brilliant、uh, GDP numbers that are coming out.、Um, I was interested by what you were saying about how COVID has changed voters' expectations of what government funding should look like, because you talk about this kind of historic economic rationalism of Australian voters and how the pandemic has changed that. Can you talk us through that? Well, going right back to the、um, troubled times in the 1970s, which all countries had, Australia went through in the 1980s and the 1990s a, pe- a, a period of very dramatic economic reform of liberalising the economy, balancing the budget. And indeed, by 2007, the Australian government had no net debt at all and、um, ran a budget surplus of about one and a half percent of GDP. And so the arguments for maintaining a balanced budget and having no debt and so on were all very potent arguments with the public. And、uh, when opposition parties would come out and promise all sorts of spending on no、uh, manner or all manner of、um, worthy causes, the public understandably would raise the questions: Yes, well, that all sounds very nice, but how would you ever pay for it? What has happened through the pandemic is that in Australia, as elsewhere, there has been a massive increase in government spending, and of course, the imposition of huge illiberal regulation on the public,、um, and that has all been very popular. And so now, all of those arguments about balancing the budget and、um, fiscal rectitude,、um, liberalised economy, a liberalised and competitive economy, and so on. Those arguments aren't cutting through with the public anymore. The public just think, well,、um, it seemed to be possible to increase spending massively without any consequence, so that's a good thing. So we should be spending still more on any manner of worthy causes,、um, and they're not any longer、um, being troubled by the consequences of that massive increase in government spending and quantitative, quantitative easing by the central bank, even though. The inflation that we're seeing everywhere is partly—it's not not totally, but is partly a consequence of the huge amount of money that is now washing around in the economy,、um, chasing approximately the same quantity of goods and services.、Um, but that that it, that argument isn't really resonating with the public at this stage, and they're they're blaming the government, the Australian government, for inflation and for price increases. And of course, realistically, there's nothing the government can do about it. They say, "Well, we had to spend all of that money to compensate for the lockdowns and restrictions of、um, of the pandemic,、um, and and you know we will gradually reduce spending, but、um, you know this all is going to take a great deal of time. And inflation is a worldwide phenomenon; it's not just an Australian phenomenon." Um, the Reserve Bank, the central bank, the equivalent of the Bank of England, has increased interest rates、um, just last week,、um, as they did. The Bank of England did in the UK, and the Reserve Bank in the US has done.、Um, and the public's response to that is, well, that's going to make life still more expensive for us, and、um, you're not managing the economy well enough.、Um, So that's the sort of zeitgeist of the country at the moment, and it's very, very difficult for the incumbent government to respond to that.、Um, you know, it's it's one thing to say that the response should be to provide still more support for the public,、um, to help them with the increasing、uh, prices, but of course the extra spending that you would put in there would have to be financed, and、yeah. that in turn is going to be inflationary and push up interest rates still further. But Um, that that's the economic truth of it, but it's very hard to get that message across to the public, at least for the time being. I mean, in in time, the public will tweak to that argument, but in the short term,、mm. they're certainly not responding to it. Well, it's fascinating how many of these political themes that you pick up、uh, in Australia are very similar to what the UK has seen as well in all of these areas. And on China, you mentioned that Scott Morrison's government has been standing up 
to China's bullying. Obviously, famously, China over the last few years has been variously boycotting Australian coal, Australian wine, Australian beef, in response to Scott Morrison's government calling for an independent inquiry into COVID's origins. But Alexander, I wondered what you think about this. I was having a conversation with someone uh, in the Australian government here in London, um, and they were saying that actually Scott Morrison didn't mean to create so much of a fuss with China by calling for that inquiry as he then got, that there was kind of lack of understanding that China would hit back in the way that it did. Do you think that rings true to you, that there is a kind of general ignorance about what the Chinese care about, what the Chinese might do in return? And, you know, what does that mean for Australians' relationship with China? Well, I think that, I think that's an unfair way of, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I think that's an unfair way of describing the problem. I mean, it was an entirely reasonable proposition for the Australian government to say there should be an independent inquiry into how COVID occurred and, and how it spread. Um, I mean, who would argue with that, given the huge damage it's done to the global economy and the lives that have been lost as a result of it. Um, it would be unnatural not to have an, um, an international and independent inquiry into it to try to get to the heart of it. What has changed has been China, um, and in particular, not the people of China, but the Chinese leadership um, under Xi Jinping. They have become more arrogant, more aggressive, and they've decided to take um, a baseball bat to Australia and to punish Australia. And I think they particularly wanted to single out Australia because um, it's a significant country, it's an important country in the Indo-Pacific region, but economically it's quite dependent on its trade with China. About 30% of Australia's exports go to China. Um, and so China um, obviously made a decision using its wolf warrior diplomacy, that it would make an example of Australia and that would frighten others off from criticising China. Um, and the Australian government's response to that has been entirely appropriate, which is that we're not going to be bullied by anyone, in particular a bunch of communists in Beijing. Um, and they have stood up to China and they, they have stood up magnificently and courageously to China. And they have been supported by the Australian public. There's no doubt about that. But no, I mean, you can't blame the Australian government um, for the change in tone and attitude of the government in Beijing. They have become uh, arrogant and aggressive, uh, rude. Um, and they've imposed, as you mentioned, sanctions on Australian exports. Um, and it's a preposterous way for them to have behaved, whereas... In years prior to that, including for the nearly 12 years I was the foreign minister, China wanted to work with and cooperate with a significant regional country like Australia, and they did well um, building um, uh, the imports from Australia that they need to prosper. They need those imports. They need iron ore. They need energy, coal and gas. Um, they need food from a country like Australia, and Australia has always been a reliable supplier. So to turn on the Australian government and the Australian people in the way they've done, it's been a known goal for China. It's damaged their economy. It's pushed up their energy prices. And now, you know, the China's economy is flatlining. They're on the precipice of going into recession, not just because of that, um, and that partly because of their endless lockdowns yeah. and zero COVID policy, which had been madness. Um, but but in any case, um, you know, that's the old strategy when you're an autocrat. If things all start going wrong, you blame the dreaded foreigner. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and the Chinese economy is estimated to grow at about 5% 5, 5 this year, which is the lowest it has been in decades. Um, you're certainly it's right, lucky. Alexander. That's fair luck. Yeah, They'll absolutely. Be lucky if their economy grows by as much as five percent, because they've also had um, severe problems with their property market as well. They've yeah. overinvested in property, um, and and what's more, they they have taken away a lot of the liberal market um, structure of their economy and made it much more centrally controlled and autocratic. Yeah, um, I certainly which think. is all about the power plays in China. So. You know, they've made one mistake after the other. The country's been really badly managed and its foreign policy is a catastrophe, alienating the world as it has done, jumping into bed at the time of the um, Winter Olympics in Beijing with uh, President Putin 
um, perhaps tipped off that he was going very quickly to take over Ukraine. And now China have found themselves globally on the wrong, wrong side of that argument. Of course, they've retreated a bit from their um, love affair with Russia. But, um, you know, it's just an example of the um, catalogue of mistakes that the Chinese leadership have been making. Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't think economics is what drives their decision making anymore. But anyway, we have to leave it there. Alexander Downer, thank you so much for joining Spectator TV. How far is Oxford to blame for Britain's problems? Financial Times journalist Simon Cooper's new book, Chums, looks at how graduates from the university have come to rule our country. Toby Young, in his column for The Spectator this week, doesn't quite agree. To debate the topic, Simon and Toby join Spectator TV. Simon Cooper and Toby Young, welcome to Spectator TV. Now, Simon, could you start by uh, outlining your new book's thesis? It's about how Oxford is so dominant in the UK politically and has been since the war. I mean, 11 of the 15 post-war prime ministers went to Oxford. And, you know, these are people from a whole range of different political views. So we're talking Thatcher, Harold Wilson, Tony Blair, David Cameron, Boris Johnson, really the whole left to right of British power. And the book then focuses on the sort of period 1983, 1993, where, again, the people who will go on to lead Labour, including Keir Starmer or Ed Balls or the Millibands are there. The people around David Cameron, who will then lead the Remain campaign, are there, uh, chiefly Cameron and Osborne. And then the people I spend most time talking about are a kind of small minority uh, within the wider Remain, let's say, Oxford. The people who will go on to lead the Brexit campaign and now rule the country. So uh, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, Jacob Rees-Mogg. So it's not that Oxford is a hotbed of Brexit, because Brexiteers are always a minority there, but these are the people who sort of won the competition in our time. So it's about Oxford, it's about the current ruling class and the grip of Oxford on, on UK power. But you do draw a causal link there, don't you? Because as you say, Brexiteers are a minority, but you draw a causal link between the culture of Oxford uh, and what it encourages and how these, as you call them, chums, came to bring about Brexit and rule the country. I don't think there's a strong causal link between Oxford and Brexit. I think there's a strong causal link between Oxford and power, and there has been in every generation. And so, you know, if you look at Harold Macmillan, in some ways he is a proto-Boris Johnson, has a very, very similar path into Oxford, and then their paths separate because of history, because in Macmillan's second year, I think World War I breaks out and he leaves Oxford forever. But I think that this group of people who I'm discussing, who are important because they, they made this huge change in the UK of Brexit and now they rule, they decided to use that power for Brexit. And I don't think that's an inevitability of Oxford at all. OK, all right. Um, Toby, in, you, in your column for the magazine this week, you write that Simon's book contains incitements to class war topped with a bit of wokery pokery. I guess you, get, you don't agree then. Well, um, I should start by saying, Cindy, that um, I very much enjoyed Simon's book. Um, it's uh, a very entertaining read. I devoured it in one sitting. Um, it's full of amusing anecdotes um, about that period. Um, and uh, I think some of the um, stuff um, documenting what went on behind the scenes at the Oxford Union and elsewhere um, struck me as spot on and very well reported. Um, so, um, you know, I... I I want to caveat everything I'm about to say by by stressing, you know, what an enjoyable, entertaining read this book is. I mean, particularly for me, because I was someone who was, you know, at Oxford in that period, but I'm sure it'll be of interest more widely. Um, but um, I do have some reservations about um, Simon's um, hypothesis. I mean, he was, I think, being slightly um, cagey there. Um, my reading of the book uh, is that you were very much trying to attribute um, the Brexit project in particular, um, to um, a sort of uh, group of Tory toffs who were typical of Oxford and typical of Oxford in this period. And you, there is this sort of Marxist analysis that it was an expression 
of class interest, that really it was about this group of toffs who thought they were born to rule, slightly cross about the fact that Westminster's delegated or transferred some of its powers to Brussels and wanted to repatriate those powers so they could then march into Westminster and claim their birthright as sort of masters of the political universe. And I think the I mean, there may be a, a sort of kernel, a grain of truth there, but I think that um, the problem with it is sort of twofold. First of all, um, uh, uh, just superficially, lots of the people who um, led the Brexit project from that generation of Oxonians like Michael Gove and Boris Johnson, even Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, are not exactly to the manner born. They're not sort of conventionally posh, particularly Michael Gove, one of the architects of the whole campaign. So I think there's, there's, there's a slight, there's a slight, and it actually, actually the people who campaigned for Remain from that Oxford generation, David Cameron, um, Rory Stewart, um, George Osborne, Jeremy Hunt, uh, Nick Bowles, Hugo Dixon, were actually a lot posher than the people um, uh, who, who, who were on the other side. So trying to link it to, you know, a sort of fading ruling class, trying to kind of reassert its dominance and reclaim its birthright, that, that struck me as a little bit simplistic and also at odds with one of the kind of um, points the book makes, which is that politics in Britain, big political policy debates aren't discussed with the seriousness that they should be. And this feels a bit like a kind of slightly low blow and ad hominem attack on the kind of architects of Brexit. Not the kind of serious point I thought Mar uh, Simon wants us to kind of bring up when discussing a big policy issue. But I think the, the fundamental flaw with this hypothesis, which I write about in my Spectator column this week, is that actually um, remaining in the EU was plainly, in my view anyway, um, uh, uh, more in the interests of Britain's, you know, ruling class than coming out of the EU. And that pattern was, um, you know, ref that, that was reflected in the pattern of votes on, you know, June 23rd in 2016. It was a genuine coalition between, you know, this elite of Oxford Tory toffs, as he calls them, and, you know, vast swathes of ordinary people across the country, whereas Remain wasn't able to put that coalition together, I think in part because remaining in the EU was identified with a particular class, a kind of class of globalists, um, anywheres, I think, as um, David Goodhart calls them. And, 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 and that was really uh, uh, why they lost. So I think he sort of fundamentally misunderstood Brexit and trying to kind of trace it to this group of kind of um, uh, uh, sort of cynical, non-serious kind of Tory toffs at Oxford, I think is a little bit simplistic. Simon? I would take issue with some of the things that Toby said there. I mean, this is not a book that tries to explain why 17 million people voted for Brexit. They had many reasons. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Boris Johnson manipulated all these people. Obviously, there were attempts to manipulate, but that is, that is what politics does. So the reasons why people voted for Brexit, I think, have been discussed in other books. What I look at here is the people who led um, the Brexit push without whom it couldn't have worked. I mean, if you just had Nigel Farage as the leader of Vote Leave, and the only person saying we must do this, then you get like the 1975 referendum, it becomes identified with the fringe, with somebody who's not seen as a responsible leader, it wouldn't have happened. So you needed people like Johnson and Gove and rees -Mogg. So I look at those people who then, after they win the referendum, they jettison Farage and they become power. Now, I don't call them in the book a ruling class. I call it a ruling caste. I mean, that's the subtitle. Because I don't think, and I say I don't think they're pursuing kind of narrow economic interests in this Marxist way that you accuse me of. I don't think they thought our class needs Brexit to protect its economic interests, which would be a Marxist analysis. I don't think that at all. I think it's a much more aesthetic choice. It's about um, attachment to British tradition. And also, as I say in the book, the idea that we are the people who from the age of eight are destined to go to Westminster and rule the country, and we don't want people from Brussels uh, pushing in on that. And what they want to do with it, with, with their power in Westminster is not so much to protect uh, some kind of vested economic interests of their caste, which anyway is becoming less economically significant as other people gain economic power in Britain. It's a much more about we are the people who traditionally rule the country and we want to do something great with that power, like our like Britain did in the past, and now Britain's becoming this sort of rather disappointing, you know, uh, offshoot of the European Union. We want more than that. They're not typical of Oxford. I mean, Oxford is a is a vast mix of mostly upper class and then middle class people like me and Toby, who um, probably were much larger in number than the group of 
let's say, boarding school educated people. And that elite was divided. Yeah. I mean, there were, as you say, there were people like Cameron and Nick Bowles who thought that um, Remain was the way forward for Britain. And so it's not that um, all those people all come out for leave at all. But I'm looking at the people who did come out for leave and were important, and I tried to investigate the reasons why they did. Um, yeah, I think that covers my retort. Mm, but Simon, why link it to Oxford at all then? If Oxford produces all sorts of people and if these people that you're talking about are a minority, why talk about uh, what assets the Oxford Union, for example, gives you in terms of debating? Why talk about the tutorial system and what skills that gives you and link it to Boris Johnson's, for example, rhetorical skills? You know, because your, your book is called Chums, How a Tiny Cast of Oxford Tories Took Over the UK. And you talk a little, a lot about the institutions of Oxford as a university and how that feeds into these people. But is, aren't they going to be found anywhere? Aren't they going to be found at Cambridge and other Russell Group universities? If, if they're cast, they could have come from Cambridge. They could have come from other universities or not from universities. But the fact is that the entire ruling group of the different factions in British politics in our time, with the exception of Corbyn, uh, Farage, he doesn't really have a party. They all come from Oxford and so have 11, as I say, 11 or 15 post-war prime ministers. So there's something very interesting about Oxford's grip on British power that is worth investigating. It turned out that for factors I explain in this generation, that produced Brexit, that group of people won. But I mean, if it had been Cameron, it would still, I think, have been worth a book about Oxford's grip on British power. Mm. And then no, Toby, the, you were and the emphasis on rhetoric and the tutorial system and the Oxford Union, I think, hugely affects the way that people who end up in Westminster um, rule and talk. Sorry, Cindy, I interrupted. No, no, no worries. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, bring Toby back in. Um, Toby, you were at Oxford during this period. You were contemporaries of many of the characters and people that Simon writes about. Is this accurate? Are, are, are these heady days of what Simon describes what the, you remember? Um, it, some of it is, uh, yes, um, uh, very evocative and um, brought it all back. Um, and uh, as I say, I don't think he, he gets the detail of um, what Oxford was like in those days wrong. Um, but I think his um, rather jaundiced view of Oxford um, and um, of the kind of cult of the gentleman amateur, the fact that, you know, people who go into politics generally don't have a science background or a maths background and that that kind of um, humanities bias, that cult of the gentleman amateur has contributed to Britain's problems and accounts for the fact that we didn't have a very serious grown-up debate about Brexit. And he also, I think, links it to Boris's um, government being at sixes and sevens at the beginning of the pandemic because, you know, they didn't have any sort of medical or scientific expertise and couldn't really cope with something that required a mastery of that kind of detail. I think that's sort of um, a bit unfair. I mean, it's a fairly familiar critique of Oxford and of the kind of British educational elite. And I think it's um, I think it's slightly unfair in that I'm not sure that people like Boris and certainly not David Cameron were as unserious as Simon presents them as being. I mean, to be fair to Simon, he does quote Dan Hannan in the book saying that when he spoke to Boris about whether Boris was going to campaign for leave or remain in 2015, Boris agonised over the decision. And that was, I had a conversation with Boris at his 50th birthday party before he'd fully made up his mind. And I think agonising over the decision is a good way to put it. He did really seem to be wrestling with it, weighing up the pros and cons, recognising that neither option um, you know that that either option was suboptimal, um, and uh, but it's it, it's it, it didn't it didn't sort of suggest that he was just this kind of you know dilettante treating it as a kind of debating topic in the Oxford Union. He was taking it very seriously, and he takes it seriously because I think at bottom he's a patriot, and I think most of the people who did campaign for Brexit, you know, however much you might disagree with uh, their point of view, I think they thought that it is in the best interests of this country and campaign for it in good faith. I mean, I'll just pick. Simon up on one particular point. Um, he, 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 he remarks frequently in the book on the dominance of a kind of handful of elite 
public schools um, at Oxford. You know, their products are wildly overrepresented at Oxford compared to the products of the school that Simon and I went to. It turns out we went to the same uh, grammar slash comprehensive in North London. Um, uh, uh, that, that's certainly true. And I, you know, I share, I share, most people, I think, share Simon's misgivings about that. Um, uh, but um, one thing you overlook, Simon, is that many of the people you condemn as members of this kind of superficial caste of kind of, you know, um, Oxford Union hacks is that actually a, a, a pretty serious effort was made um, under the coalition government and, and beyond to try and reform British education, to try and improve standards in state schools, to try and make sure that Oxford, Cambridge, the Russell Group more generally, wasn't as dominated as it is by products of a few elite schools. You know, Michael Gove, I think, was very serious about that. Dominic Gove was involved in that project. David Cameron supported um, Gove and cared about that himself. You know, if the, if 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 in if your your kind of analysis, which is that th- this kind of cast of kind of toffs wanting to kind of restore their birthright and restore powers to Westminster, so they could they could then become masters of the universe, and it was all about perpetuating their own privilege. If that's correct, then how do you explain that they made this pretty serious good faith effort to actually um, reduce? the influence of of their class and people from their schools. You know, it seems to me it's a bit one sided. You don't really you're not really quite fair to um, uh, this group that you evidently don't like very much and blame for many of Britain's problems. I mean, there has been a push in recent years, in the last five years in particular, I would say, to make Oxbridge in particular uh, more fair in admissions. And so there's been a huge rise since about 2017 in the number of state school people getting into Oxbridge. I think at Oxford now it's 68% state school, which uh, in the last year, which is the highest ever recorded. I mean, a lot of those people come from the posher kinds of state schools. They um, So it, state school covers a variety of sins. So if you're from a leafy grammar in Buckinghamshire, that's a state school. So Oxford is totally not there yet, but things have got better. I agree that Gove was serious about making British education fairer. I would say the situation as it was when Toby and I went to university was just totally unsustainable. I mean, it's hard to think of a Western, of a European country with that level of unfairness in admissions in the 80s. So only about one in eight people were going to university at all. And if you wanted to do classics, which typically meant that you'd come from a public school, your chance of getting into Oxford in the early 80s was two in three. It really was not that competitive. And just dozens and dozens of people from public schools would come in. So yes, Oxford now, if I were writing a book about Oxford in 2022, it would be different. But the thing is that the elite is produced 30 years earlier, that um, the people we see in power today come from a past that I've tried to disinter in the book, just on lack of seriousness. I mean, whether you're for or against Brexit, I didn't want to write a book about Brexit is bad, Brexit is good. I'm against Brexit, but I thought it would be incredibly boring to write a book saying Brexit is a bad idea. The whole British nation has had that debate for six years. Everyone's fed up with it. Nobody changed their minds. But whether you're for or against, in the referendum, there should have been serious debates about the customs union, about the Irish border, about a divorce bill, about the single market. How does that work? You stay in the single market, but you leave the EU. What are the modalities of doing that, that was not discussed by either side. And so that, to me, the referendum, whichever side you're on, was not serious enough for the task at hand. Simon, just very finally, I wanted to, uh, something that struck me about your book at the near the end was solutions that you talk about uh, to, to not make Oxford this kind of elite hotbed. Um, and you say that perhaps Oxford should stop teaching undergraduates. So I just wondered all your thoughts about that, because in light of the conversation that we've just been having about how much more diverse it's becoming, you know, full disclosure, I went to Oxford, I did PPE at Christchurch, one of the most infamous colleges there, but I went to a state school and I'm also an immigrant who wasn't even born in this country, I had to learn English at the age of 10. Oxford for me was life changing. If you stop taking undergraduates, you know, you'd be denying opportunities to not people like the future Boris Johnson, but people like me. So, how do you square that? Well, somebody like you, I mean, here we are, three state school people who went to Oxford and um, ended up lucky. But how do you, as somebody like you, could have gone to another university? That would have been great. You could have gone to the University of London or uh, you could have gone to 
Reading or Bristol, you could have had an excellent experience because you're a motivated, intelligent person. Then you could have gone to Oxford at 22 under what I propose and do graduate work. What I'd love to see, and I say at the end of the book, is an Oxbridge for all. That we say, you know, you're 35 years old, you didn't go to university first time round, or um, you didn't have a, a good or sufficient experience. You are not from a class that was directed towards Oxbridge, but you're bright, you're intellectual. We're going to take you. And you can have a year at Oxford or three months or whatever it is that, that that works for you, we have time for. And so we spread the undoubted excellence of a lot of Oxford to a much broader part of the population than just this really rather small group of middle class plus upper class people that for most of, even today, for most of the last few hundred years, it's been educating. So would you say not to end undergraduate teaching at Oxford then, just spread the goodness a bit more? Uh, I, I would, I, I just think it's the grit, the unfairness of the selection essentially at age zero or age six to Oxford and therefore your ticket to the establishment. Well, not quite in my case. <laughs> not in your case, but um, unusual exception. I'd, I'd be interested to hear what Toby thinks. Toby. Toby. Um, well, I, I certainly think that, um, uh, you know, more children from state schools should be going to Oxford and Cambridge and to elite universities more generally and you know um, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time over the past um, uh, 10 or 12 years um, trying, to, trying, to, trying to help um, in various ways um, you know setting up um, co-founding four free schools and a multi-academy trust and doing our best to encourage all the children at those schools to uh, aim high educationally um, but um, I mean my experience of Oxford I think in some ways was um, different um, to Simon's um, and um, I, seemingly I had a kind of slightly better experience than he did. I mean, that, that may be wrong. I think that's, I just say, I think that's wrong. I had a really good time. I really enjoyed it. I don't okay. feel bitter about it. Go on. I, don't feel bitter about well, I, I was going to say that um, uh, I, um, in the group of people studying PPE at Brasenose, um, who came up in 1983, um, there, were, there were 10 of us, I think. And within that group of 10, a huge range of um, political views from a kind of Monday club kind of tub thumper on one on, at one end to a kind of libertarian conservative at the other um, and it, it, it whereas I went to Harvard um, uh, a couple of years after Oxford and within the entire Harvard government department there was nothing like that range of views it was really just kind of people arguing about different interpretations of liberalism. It was Nozickian liberalism versus Rawlsian liberalism. And that was really the only debate. And I like the fact that at Oxford, there was this kind of huge range of different opinions. And it spoke of a kind of pluralism, a real intellectual diversity accompanied by uh, a good deal of intellectual tolerance and uh, real debates about really important big issues. And, um, and I think it would be a shame to lose that and replace it with something kind of more technical, more vocational. I, I wouldn't focused. say technical or vocational. I mean, if you're 35 and you didn't go to university, but you're very bright and you want to study Shakespeare at Oxford, great. But Simon, you can't have it both ways. Either an Oxford education is a good that more people should be having, or it's bad and we shouldn't be giving it to anyone. It's not either good or bad. Uh, it can be good and it can be bad. I think that there was a lot of kind of skating over thin ice, winging it, lazing around. Uh, Oxford education wasted on 18-year-olds who took their privilege for granted. But it also is not the highest, one of the highest ranking universities in the world for nothing. You know, it, there is a lot of hard work and intelligent people going there. Uh, you, ranking is mostly about research. And Oxford has the largest research budget of any European university. It has amazing uh, academics now much more than in the 80s because in the 80s a lot of them didn't even have phds and published in the paper um and it does it does some fantastic research and i think that um the teaching it does i would rather see spread much more broadly to a much wider range of talent all right okay well i think we'll have to leave it there simon cooper and toby young thank you so much for joining spectator tv and finally, why were photographers drawn to Palestine in the 1940s? Roger Hardy's new book, The Bride, is a collection of these wonderful photos and is reviewed in the book section by the historian and journalist Justin Marozzi. To tell us about his new book, Roger joins me now. Roger Hardy, welcome to Spectator TV. Now, your book is an illustrated history of Palestine from 1850 to about 1948. Can you start by telling us briefly what was going on in that time? Well. Western involvement um, in Palestine 
involvement um, motivated by politics, but very much by religion. And in a way, religion and politics absolutely knitted together. Um, we can say that, I mean, historically, when we think of religion, of course, Palestine was a holy land for the three great monotheistic religions, uh, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. But why did I start in 1850? Because the European competition really for Palestine, for influence in Palestine really begins in eight, around 1850, around the middle of the century, because the West had kind of lost interest um, in Palestine. And in any case, it was a backwater. It was an inaccessible place under centuries of, of rule by the Ottoman Turks. It's been very hard for people to go there. So in that time, um, or up to that time, it was in a way a country of the mind. People imagined the Holy Land of their Sunday school classes. Um, they imagined a beautiful land um, still frozen, as it were, into, a, into biblical time, mm. uh, as if all those shepherds and guys wearing funny robes um, were exactly the same as they were in the time of Christ. It wasn't true, but it was a nice idea. And beyond all that, the Christian powers I'm talking about, the Western powers, Europeans, also Russians, don't forget Orthodox Christianity, and then a little bit later, the United States, uh, United States comes in. They revere Palestine, they want it, and in some sense, they want to possess it, which they never felt about. I mean, British didn't feel that way about Egypt, for example. Egypt had the Suez Canal, it was important, but you didn't want to desire it, you didn't want to possess it. And so they're rivals with one another, the Catholics against the Protestants, the Catholics and the Protestants against the Orthodox. And each of those religious groups has got an outside sponsor, a, a European power or Russia uh, later on. So it's the beginning of the struggle for Palestine, which reaches its climax at the end of the story. And your book is full of amazing pictures from um, the century that you're looking at. And you talk about, you know, shepherds in funny robes herding sheep, but there is really a picture like that uh, that you've got in here from the early 1900s. But, but you've written about how it's been used, some of these pictures for propaganda reasons. Can you tell us about that? You can look at a picture like that and say, well, it's a nice picture. I mean, it reminds me exactly of the children's Bible or of the Sunday school classes that I attended rather unwillingly as I remember. But you look at, to me, the question, um, I'm not an expert on photography, by the way, but I learned as I went along and I had some really very, very good advisors. Um, the key question is who took this picture? Who asked them or paid them to take this picture and why? We don't always know the answer, but in that case, we do. They wanted to, it was a staged performance. They wanted to recreate Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And we actually know, it gets slightly funny, that uh, the, the, the photographer and his assistant were both from Sweden. They were fundamentalist Christians who'd come to the Holy Land waiting for Christ to come again for the second coming. So Larson sends ahead his young assistant, a guy called Eric Matson, to pay off the shepherd and pay off the owner of the sheep. So it's like a stage performance. And what's the aim, the underlying aim, the implicit aim? to create or propagate the myth, perpetuate the myth that Palestine is unchanged since biblical times. This is the kind of guy that Jesus would have encountered. I mean, it's not true. It simply wasn't true, but an awful lot of people wanted to believe that it was true. I also want to talk through a few of the other incredible photos in your book. Um, for example, you have one of a woman and child walking through an alley uh, lined by barbed wire. Can you tell us a story behind that? It's a slightly later picture uh, from the last uh, chapter of the book, which, as I say, reaches its denouement. And I found th this is the moment which for Israelis is a moment of triumph. They've created their state, the birth of the state. And I call it the improbable birth of the state of Israel. There was nothing preordained about it. It wasn't destined to succeed on the contrary. It did succeed. Um, 
But the Palestinians lost out. I, I call them the victims of British failure, the failures of British imperialism. The British tried to rule Palestine and in the end threw in the towel uh, and walked away. Uh, in the fight that ensued, the Israelis won. The Israelis have their state to this day, and the Palestinians have what they call the Nakba, the catastrophe. So I wanted an image of the Nakba, what it means and what it feels like for Palestinians. And this was by, funnily enough, an, another Swede, a Swedish uh, photographer called Per Olof Andersen, who went to the camps just afterwards, so the early 50s, and the woman is blind. And the little child leading her, and the camp is in Gaza, um, and the little girl is her grandchild, leading her. So it seemed to me a very strong image of the Nakba or the aftermath of the Nakba, the consequences of what all this meant. For people who'd lived and uh, lived in their homes and owned their land for centuries um, before the Zionists and their Jewish settlements uh, with their Jewish set their new Jewish settlements came, um, is that a biased statement? I don't think so. I mean, it's a historical fact that the Palestinian Arabs had lived there, yes, under Ottoman rule, and yes, Palestine was not an independent entity. It was simply part, a province of the Ottoman Empire. But they'd lived there for hundreds of years. Um, and the Jewish settlers, of course, uh, won. They won through warfare. And in some sense, the morality of the whole issue, of course, fiercely contested to this day. The, the moral rights and wrongs were subordinated by the fact of that might is right. The Israelis won the battle for Palestine. Britain by that time had withdrawn. So there was nobody, no outside power, no third party to stop the Israelis uh, winning. I'm not saying, by the way, it was easy. Uh, ben Gurion, the, the, the father of the Jewish state, turned to his advisors when war was about to start. He said, what are our chances? They said, 50-50. And they were right, I think. Mm. And of course, the Israeli settlers and the Jews who came afterwards went through their, their own fair amount of suffering as well. Um, I thought you put it very well when you said it was a moral ambiguity at the heart of Israel's existence, um, which your book is all about. I think so. And what intrigued me, I didn't know this until I did the research over the last six, six or seven years it took me to write the book. Uh, Ben-Gurion's most recent biographer, a very brilliant Israeli journalist and writer called Tom Sego, in his biography of Ben-Gurion says that while publicly, of course, he defended what Israel did, Israelis, Israeli actions in 1948, and of course his own actions as being at the, the center of the drama, but according to Segev, privately, Ben-Gurion was haunted for the rest of his life by the Palestinian exodus. And you're haunted by a ghost. Now, why are you haunted by a ghost in this case? Without wanting to read Ben-Gurion's mind, I think he knew that there was a moral ambiguity at the heart of Israel's existence, or at the minimum, at the very least, that there'd be people in the world, especially the Western world, which is what he cared about most, who would think that there was a moral ambiguity, an element of doubt. I found that very revealing by a biography who'd, who's written a, a brilliant uh, book about Ben-Gurion. Roger Hardy, thank you so much for joining Spectator TV. That's it for this week. Once again, we're delighted that Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management is sponsoring the week in 60 minutes. Canaccord will provide the expertise you need to build your wealth with confidence. You can visit candowealth.com to find out more. And don't forget to subscribe to The Spectator's YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. Thanks for watching and do join us again next week.